Bounty hunters have long been a staple of the Star Wars universe, and over the years, they've been central characters in all manner of Star Wars media, from the films to the novels of the expanded universe. The Mandalorian, one of the more popular Star Wars titles, recently brought a whole new side of bounty hunting into the spotlight, the Bounty Hunters Guild. To fans of Legends, this guild was nothing new, but to those unfamiliar with the works of the old expanded universe, the guild might need a bit of explaining. Who was part of the guild, and who wasn't? What sort of chapters and rules did it have? In this video, we'll be answering all of these questions. Attention, Sergeant on deck! A quick note before we begin. The Bounty Hunters Guild is pretty similar across canon and legends, but there are discrepancies, so it shouldn't be assumed that the guild has the same history across both timelines. As such, please keep in mind that the information we'll be discussing here will be legends unless explicitly stated otherwise, as is the usual here on the channel. The Bounty Hunters Guild was formed during the days of the Old Republic, at a time when the Jedi were increasingly coming into conflict with rogue bounty hunters, often resulting in needless deaths. The Jedi Order petitioned the Senate to do something about this problem, and the Senate's solution was essentially for the bounty hunters to police themselves by forming guilds. Those guilds that cooperated with Republic authorities were officially sanctioned by the Republic, given first pick of official government bounties and encouraged to cooperate with the Jedi instead of hindering them. Eventually, these various guilds united into one, forming the aptly named Bounty Hunters Guild, led initially by the hunters Thrask, Tiso, Sayasi, and Kikram Pont. The guild was, from the very beginning, not all that tight-knit of an organization. It was more of a cool kids club for professional bounty hunters, which gave its members advance notice of most bounties and theoretically held them to a common creed. This creed was as follows. No bounty is worth dying for. People don't have bounties, only acquisitions have bounties. Capture by design, kill by necessity. No hunter shall slay another hunter. No hunter shall interfere with another's hunt. In the hunt, one captures or kills, never both. No hunter shall refuse aid to another hunter. As you might expect, bounty hunters weren't too strict about following this creed, and most of those who broke the rules got away with it. During particularly dark times in galactic history, such as during the Sith Wars, the creed sometimes fell out of fashion altogether, and the Bounty Hunters Guild became little more than a loose alliance between bounty hunters, one that was regularly broken. However, there were also many periods of galactic history in which the guild was both honourable and prestigious, when the creed was held as sacrosanct. This was the case during the Golden Age of the Republic, during which the guild was a noted ally of the Jedi Order. The Bounty Hunters Guild itself had very few rules. Instead, most of the organization within the guild happened within the guild's various chapters. Different guild chapters had different recruiting policies, different requirements, and different reputations, with their only common cause being the alliance and protection represented by the guild as a whole. There were quite a few guild chapters that rose and fell over the years, but the major ones in operation during the movie era were Crimson Nova, House Benelex, House Nuvalis, House Paramexor, House Renless, House Salictori, House Tresario, The Mantis Syndicate, The Ragnar Syndicate, The Skyne Bounty Hunter College, and The Slaver Syndicate. Many of these guild chapters were known for their unique specialities. House Tresario focused on hunting pirates, while House Paramexor only hunted murderers, and House Benelix focused on kidnapping retrieval. The Skyne Bounty Hunter College sponsored the top hunters in a variety of different fields and claimed its members were the most highly trained in the guild. House Salactori and the secretive House Nuvalis recruited only the most elite bounty hunters in the galaxy while House Renless exclusively enlisted female hunters and only accepted bounties for male targets. Other guild chapters diverged from the traditional styles of bounty hunters or dabbled in some of the more taboo elements of the bounty hunting profession. 
The Ragnar Syndicate, in particular, was known for its unorthodox tactics, while the Slaver Syndicate was feared for its willingness to turn captured bounties over to slavers. The Mantis Syndicate was completely lacking in subtlety and specialized in mass hunts, usually sending full battalions of hunters after swoop gangs and other large groups. One of the most powerful chapters in the guild was Crimson Nova, an infamous band of rogues that specialized in hunting Jedi. Officially, all chapters of the Bounty Hunters Guild were under the purview of the Senate, but as Crimson Nova and the Slaver Syndicate exemplified, that didn't stop chapters from bucking Republic law now and again. A particularly notorious example of this came during the Clone Wars when Separatist leaders posted several massive bounties on Jedi. The guild as a whole forbade its members from taking these bounties, but many hunters went ahead and took them anyway. Crimson Nova even started publicly handing out Jedi bounties to its members in defiance of both guild leadership and the Republic. This led to hundreds of bounty hunters linking up with Separatist forces for privateer work, a problem that got so bad it turned the tide of the Battle of Null in the Confederacy's favour. In the chaos of the Clone Wars, it ultimately fell to the Jedi themselves to put a stop to Crimson Nova's misdeeds, as neither guild leadership nor the Senate were in a position to tell the bounty hunters to knock it off. Shortly after the Battle of Null, Jedi Masters Mace Windu, Sacy Tin, Kit Fisto, and Aegon Cola all took a break from the war and launched a four-man attack on the Rig, the space station that contained Crimson Nova's headquarters. In a stunning display of pure badassery that might be worth its own video, the four Jedi Masters tore up the rig and dealt with Crimson Nova's leadership, putting an end to the bounty hunter privateering for the time being. But that was neither the first nor the last time that members of the Bounty Hunters Guild got out of control. The Dark Wars featured another prime example of the guild's ineffectiveness at reigning in its members. That was a time when rampant lawlessness and the ongoing implosion of the Republic led to the guild becoming more of a haven for outlaws than a professional organization, to the point where the guildmaster at the time, a Trandoshan named Vosk, got tired of it all and quit. During the Dark Wars, the crime lord Goto posted a bounty on any surviving Jedi, with a reward so high that the recipient could purchase a whole sector's worth of planets with it. While Goto stipulated that he wanted the Jedi brought to him alive, many bounty hunters nonetheless took his bounty as permission to kill all Jedi. The best bounty hunters of this era, including the Wookiee Hanha, the Huntress Mira, the Twin Sons, an army of Duros called the Zook Brothers, the HK-50 assassin droids, and an entire tribe of Gand joined the hunt, and ended up fighting each other in a massive bounty hunter war when the last Jedi finally revealed herself. A similar conflict actually ended up completely destroying the guild shortly after the Battle of Yavin. Under the Empire, the guild became more powerful than ever before, as the Empire supplied it with a healthy stream of high-paying bounties to claim. However, a lot of the credits that poured into the guild in this period went right into the coffers of the guild's old guard, a faction led by the Trandoshan Kradoksk, the guildmaster and father of Bosk. A lot of the younger bounty hunters, including Bosk himself, resented this, viewing the older hunters as weak and soft. When Boba Fett joined the guild after years of avoiding it in one ABY, these upstarts found themselves a leader, and the bounty hunter wars erupted. In the span of a few months, the guild tore itself apart, many weaker hunters were killed, and Kratos himself was killed and devoured by his own son. This worsened the reputation of bounty hunting as a collective to the galaxy at large, but it made the surviving bounty hunters much more useful to the Empire, which no longer had to sift through weaker bounty hunters to find those who would get the job done. The guild ended up reforming after this, but it was never quite as strong as it had been before. As a final note, we should mention that a good many bounty hunters weren't members of the guild at all. As we just mentioned, Boba Fett avoided joining for nearly 20 years, and his father had never been a member either. This was actually a persistent problem for the guild over the millennia. Most of the absolute best bounty hunters either didn't join the guild or broke with it after making names for themselves, usually to avoid paying guild dues. 
Cad Bane was yet another famous hunter who disliked the guild, and in canon, Fennec Shand was never a member either. So, that's our look at the Bounty Hunters Guild, but what do you think? Would you like to see more videos about Bounty Hunters in the future? Which ones? Let us know all that and more in the comments section below guys, and as always, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to catch you in the next video.